sitting here, so let's go live. If anything, it'll be a good VOD. Yeah. And we can answer questions from Discord, if anything. But I'm sure we'll have something to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have something to talk about. We'll just rant <clears throat> about design patterns. All right, I think we're live. I'm going to go ahead and make sure um, real quick. And I go to that URL I was I sharing earlier. <laughs> yeah, it looks like we're going live. Cool. Nice. Are we, we're live. All right, well, um, this is going to be a Q&A about uh, game development and Unity 3D. So if you have any questions regarding those two topics, explicitly about code, uh, you're talking with myself, Charles Mott, who uh, has the channel Fallible Code, if you don't know. And we're going to be doing, oh, I'm a, I'm a software developer. And then we've got Jason Story as well with us. Um, let me switch to that view. And, and we, uh, and he's, he's a, a programmer, programmer as well. He's, he's a, a professional, professional game, game developer. developer. You, you can, can believe, believe it that such a thing, thing exists. <laughs> hey, I, I, I usually say professional comma game developer. They're different things. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so let, let me just pull up my chat. chat. I see if we, we got, got some, some, some people chatting here. here. Ooh, love, love your series about Spatial OS. OS. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, you're one of the few that I've received feedback on, so that's good to, good to see that. Um, oh, I'm going to say your name right this time. Vokarol. Tell me if I said that correctly. He, he was talking about that chat on Discord. Vuckerol, yes, yes, you're, you're live. live. Awesome. Uh oh, oh we, we got, got an echo. echo. Shoot. So, how do I get rid of that? Okay, I know how to get rid of that. Let me know if the echo is gone now. Just have to mute, I think, mute the Skype call inside of uh, OBS here. All right, cool. I'm glad you guys joined us today. Hey, and I said your name right. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Can you guys see us as well? I saw that there were there are no cameras that might have been said before I switched. <clears throat> hey guys, agreed. Design patterns are always a good thing to rant about. <laughs> awesome. Echo is gone. Looks like we're on good stuff. On the screen. Cool. Well, are there any questions? Feel free to drop them in the chat. Anything you want to talk about, Jason? Oh, there, there's plenty I want to talk about. There was we were having <laughs> this discussion earlier about design patterns, but I kind of want to to, to let things sort of. Um, uh, happen more organically. I imagine there's a few there's a few topics that I'm sure have come up before. Um, most notably, the the separation between your code in the back end versus the the code you write that sort of hits Unity. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm just curious what what actually I'm curious what people are doing at the moment for that. How are they decoupling their code from sort of? Do, do, am I I'll put it another way? Am I the only one who writes a large portion of his code outside of Unity? Right. Yeah, that's uh, it's interesting, you know, like I, I basically writing a class library first, right, and then pulling that into Unity and using your classes. Um, it's funny that there's kind of a logistical problem there, too, when you do that, like, yeah, you have to build out the DLL. And I actually I'm sure you've done this, too. But, you know, using the I think it's like build steps or something, you can automate that process. Every time you build it, it'll drop it the DLL into, you know, the folder that you need it to be dropped, like your Unity project. Yeah, yeah, I have I have that entirely set up so that when I post build after my tests run, post it exports it. Yeah, it, it it does that. There's post steps, and I, I have one for a post build step for dropping the DLL into my Unity project. So it's continuously integrated from that perspective. And because I'm using Writer, and Writer's a lot better with refreshing with Unity, mm -hmm. uh, I don't get that whole big giant freeze that Unity used to do when <laughs> Visual Studio would go through its refresh. So I could literally write code, make changes in it outside of Unity, inside of just plain um, Writer in a DLL. And then it'll refresh Unity. And even if I've got referenced classes and stuff in there, they'll all refresh automatically. So when I say I work outside of Unity, I don't. It, it, it's not like I'm working in a in a box elsewhere and then dragging DLLs in. You know, you can automate that entire pipeline. It's just it's a good reminder when I work outside of it that I don't need to reference Unity DLLs if I don't have to. So it's just it keeps things isolated when I work on things that really don't actually require Unity. Now, do you do DLL? So like you create a class library and you put it straight into a Unity project, or do you have you ever used the Unity class library, a Unity class library that like Writer has a template for? I don't know if you've seen that. No, I actually didn't even know that was a thing. That's interesting. I'll have to look into that. I, what I normally do is I will create a new solution. So say I have a project and it's called you know my project. What I would do is I create a my project solution, <clears throat> and then with my Unity project I use the U prefix. So I use U dot my project. So mm -hmm. I have a Unity version and then a non-Unity version. And in that non-Unity version, I would have my project as the base class library. <coughs> Excuse me. 
and out of my project dot unity as the unity integration for that project. So I end up with three different sections. I have mm. one portion that is the actual unity project, one portion that's um, platform agnostic code for this project. And then I have a bit, which is the unity tie ins because you can reference the unity DLL inside of a class library. So between right. all three, it sounds like I, it sounds like I'm making an awful lot of architecture, but it's not really because you, <laughs> you set this thing up once. It's just and I have it mostly down to templates and I can do things automatically. Yeah. And I just have three folders to put code into. And it's just as if I had this is unity specific. This is not unity specific. And then this is kind of global for the whole thing. So that's that's all it is. It's not really super um, high architecture. It's just purely giving myself buckets of organized code. And the benefit of that is when I come by later and I want to take a portion out of the project, and move it to something else, use a different project, I can take a bit that has zero connection to Unity or even just to this project and I can reuse it elsewhere. So it, also the whole unit testing and stuff is easier as well. So, Yeah, definitely unit testing is easier on a regular class library. Um, and, and what's also cool is now that Unity has the pa their package managers a little more mature, you can you, you can export those as packages, give them, give them some light documentation, some information. I actually shared my screen here because uh, I was just going oh, to Unity show that. Oh, Unity Class Library, yeah. Yeah, just, and it references the Unity Engine DLL, so you can basically you know, create a Unity Class Library. Nice. So that's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. I, I did it. Um, I was work. I was messing around with this inventory that I was working on just for fun, trying to model the World of Warcraft inventory mm -hmm. system with the bags and all that. Um, and yeah, I did that. I made a class library. I made a, a Unity class library, and then I made the Unity project. And so yeah, it's a. I mean, if it's the first time you're ever doing that and you're not familiar with working with class libraries and stuff like that, it's. It feels like why am I doing all this? But. In the long run, you know, it is beneficial. I see that um, someone asked, what are the benefits of a non-Unity versions? I'm imagining he's talking about, I guess, the code that is like platform agnostic. Yeah, I, I guess, I, I think I'd put a big caveat to everything I've said and say that if you're not familiar with working with class libraries and working externally, don't bother. It's one of those <laughs> things that it works for people who know what they're doing and how they've been doing it for a while. And you might find use in it later in your career, but <clears throat> it's it's just that I come from a background of writing my code for enterprise software, um, committing it, running unit tests on it, and then having some level of continuous integration. So for people who are not familiar with that term, it means every time you make changes and save your code and commit it to your source control, all your tests will rerun. So your code is consistently in a state of being verified if it works or not. And that means you can have a large chunk of your code that lives in this sort of tidy bubble that is easy to test because Unity by its nature is just very hard to test because the mono behavior sort of, it, it's like a it's like a weed that creeps into every aspect of your code, even when you're not using it. So <laughs> whenever you find yourself making a mono behavior, you don't really think about it. But if you press F12 on the declaration of the word mono behavior, you'll see how big that file is. And so if you, you can go down even further into component and see how big that is. And after a while you start to realize, hang on a second, I've just written the word mono behavior in this empty script, but this script has like, I don't know, something in, somewhere in the realm of like 500 lines of code inherited down the chain to add support for features like physics and audio and <clears throat> component management and positional data. And it's like, am I using that when I write health dot amount plus equals five? Like, am I needing any of that stuff that I'm doing? And is, is that going to make my life easier or harder to test or work with? And in my opinion, a lot of that stuff is unnecessary and harder to work with. So if I can just write a plain C Sharp script in a plain C Sharp project and just talk about adding a number to an int, test that it works, I have a piece of code which works outside of Unity, works anywhere I'd ever want to use it, it's easy to test, and I can drop it into Unity and get all the Unity benefits and features I want, I just don't have to rely on them. Because if you yeah. do it inside of Unity and you try to take that script out, you'll get a bunch of errors. I need mono behavior, I need transforms, I need get component calls. It's like, well... Do you need those things? So the script may think it does, but if you can separate the two, you can clean your code a lot. So now you, you can get a lot of this benefit without doing the separate DLLs. The separate DLLs is just a way of me moving it back into a more comfortable workflow that I'm used to. But you can do this by just having a folder in your Unity project, which is make a rule to yourself. Anything that goes in here doesn't reference mono behavior. And if you do that, you can at least keep a chunk of your code kind of cleaner than the rest of it in terms of what it references. And then that that's kind of halfway there. So. So that's yeah, that's you you hit the nail on the head there. I got nothing to add. Um, 
Now, I do see that we've got some questions, uh, so we're going to jump into the chat there. But before we do, I'd like to uh, just ask that if you could just throw a like on this video. It really does help um, for visibility. Gets the gets the word out here that we've got some game developers answering questions. And uh, as a bonus, if you could share this video, it's one of the one of the best ways you can help support this channel and this stream is you could uh, share that on Twitter or Facebook and just kind of let everyone know. All right, so now that marketing stuff is out of the way. <laughs> well, actually, one my... question I, I have for you here yeah. because I, th I think this uh, it's an interesting question. Is There's a number of questions here where the general theme is if you want to break into the games industry or you want to start doing this professionally, mm. uh, any tips or tricks or what do you do or where do you learn? Like that, That's a very all-encompassing question, so how would you approach <laughs> answering that? Yeah, so breaking into the games industry. Well, um, well, funny enough, I don't actually work in the game industry, so I mean, I can answer as how to break into the industry in general as a developer, and that's obviously you're going to want to. Uh, I mean, options out there are interning, and I, again, I don't really know in the game industry if like internships are a thing. I, I don't know if you can speak to that, but um, interning, uh, you know, contributing as a consultant is something that's mm, maybe when you're first starting out isn't the best thing to do, but uh, and I know that there are some. Sometimes you can consult and do very low-level things that are, you know, not necessarily um, making design decisions, but at least getting some experience, uh, like tackling some low-hanging fruit. Um, obviously, working on your resume. Yeah, I don't know. What do you think, Jason? Well, I think it's one of those ones that's a little bit of a weird trick question because hmm. there isn't there isn't a road that gets you from where you are yeah, to work in not the games one industry. Road. And even even the the idea of trying to, it, it's one of those, it's such a cliche. But when you're not looking for it, it'll arrive, kind of thing. <laughs> and and I can I can really attest to this personally. And, and most people I've talked to that I work with in games will tell me the same thing. I literally went to college and did a course with games in the title. So I went in education for, to to, to kind of learn how to, to be a game developer to some degree. Um, and after the course was done, I ended up working in a bank <laughs> because you just there's no <laughs> jobs in, especially in Ireland where I am, where you can kind of dive into the games industry. The only jobs in the games industry that were available at the time were in call centers doing support for, I think mm. at the time it was a Star Wars MMO. I can't remember what it was. There was some game and it was it kind of recently opened up a, um, a couple of new offices. But they wanted people with uh, phone support experience who'd been doing it for 20 years or, or 10 years even. They wouldn't they wouldn't hire a graduate. So there's no graduate opportunity. So I basically went in, worked in banking. And so how I got into the industry, so to speak, uh, was actually nothing to do with my day job. I was sitting there at work every day as a programmer doing programmer boring stuff. And I spent all of my free time in subreddits. So I spent all of my free time on slash our Unity 3D, uh, on uh, I did the same on slash game dev and most importantly Oculus. At the time, the Oculus subreddit was about two thousand people, so that's really not that many in the grand scheme of things. And these were a bunch of tight knit people who were really interested in the same topics. And at the time, VR chat was a new product; no one had ever heard of it. Um, Jesse and Graham were making it by themselves, and there was like four people who would go and visit it, and they would have meetups with just a few people, and we'd meet up and we'd have a chat about stuff, and then slowly but surely, you do that for three, four months, you make friends, you meet up with people, and then you, you end up getting op options for different things you can do. So from there, I got offered to work on some game jams because there was people doing various different projects and they're artists but didn't have any programming ability. And I said I'd help. So the, the kind of the long story short of all of that is you're not going to, very few people I know of will do a course or something equivalent to a course and find themselves at the job they want. What happens instead is you join communities of things you are interested in you will meet like-minded people, and if you can find what skills need to be done, if you could, if you have a skill they don't have, if you're an artist in a room of programmers or vice versa, you can then offer your skills to help for free, meet the right people, and then after a while, you become known as a guy who can do that stuff, and then you can eventually um, meet the right people and, and start kind of branching off from there. And so where I am now is I own a contracting company. With, um, I work with some of the people I still I met back then. I still work with them today, and I'm entirely self-employed. And I didn't start that way. Again, I worked in a bank and I did that for years. And it wasn't, I, I kind of given up on the idea of doing games. And what got me into games was just meeting people and talking to the right people and having the right connections. So there, unfortunately, there isn't like a follow this 10 step program. The, the trick mm -hmm. is simply find like-minded people, group up, work on fun projects. 
and you'll eventually someone will someone will get successful and you just ride their coattails until all of you are successful <laughs> that's kind of the way it works <laughs> Yeah, uh, definitely. It's it's who you know and who you rub shoulders with, and and you can just position yourself by getting getting involved with communities online. Like for instance, in, in the Infallible Code Discord server, uh, Ruby Nova, who's one of our admins, uh, he he actually landed a job uh, with a gaming company. Uh, I think they did like, I think it was like casino type gaming, but nonetheless gaming. And uh, yeah, he he landed a job and went and moved. I think to the Netherlands or something to work with them. And so, yeah, it's, I have a meetup here that I go to where I live in Atlanta and, uh, you know, I've met a lot of people there and, um, even though I'm not looking for an opportunity, opportunities have arisen, you know, that were, you know, it was just an option. So that's, that's basically probably your best bet. Try to get to know people and, you know, provide value to some community in some way. And I think generally and it's, and it's speaking, pretty small a, as well as a, as a community, like you'll end up meeting a lot of people. Like yeah. when you're at the same parties with John Carmack, you're like, how did this happen? <laughs> I didn't plan <laughs> this, you know? So it's, it's pretty cool. Like you can, you'll be surprised. I, I, I got to meet a load of developers of games I've played and that's a really cool feeling because the same people who are passionate about games that want to get into the industry are the same people who used to be passionate about games, got into the industry and now make games. So you're bound to meet the people that you, you know, that make games you like if you kind of stick with it and go to the right group and meetups and go to the various events and stuff like that's all it really takes is just meeting people and slowly worming yourself in you know <laughs> someone says but if you build a game and publish it does that count as being in the industry <laughs> i guess <laughs> sure <laughs> well i I would, I would be kind of it's it's, it's interesting and, I, and this is coming coming from my perspective that may not be universal but I've technically been doing VR for four years almost, uh, right around the time the Oculus was sort of pre-announcing. Um, and I spent the first two of those years living in Ireland, just sort of doing it online, talking to people. And that was good. I, I met a few people, but my kind of network was very small. And so in retrospect, I don't consider that I was in the game industry then, because at the time I knew the four or five people I talked to and I was interested in it, and I, I did a lot of research in it. I had a, you know, passion for it, but I wasn't making any connections. I wasn't going to the right places. And as frustrating as it sounds, I had to start going to London and going to LA and meeting people and doing stuff to really branch into the point where I had phone numbers of people I wanted to have phone numbers of. You know, like you have to kind of get out there and do some stuff and meet some people. So I would say it's 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 you know I know it's a bit of a meme question but the, the truth is <laughs> there there is a point where you can make games and you can be kind of in the indie scene and that's great and that might be as far as you want to go but you really do if you want to hit that point where you you start branching out and getting a lot of work and scaling up your business you'll have to sort of bite the bullet and save up and go to Oculus Connect or go to any one of the other kind of similar meetups depending on the platform or industry you're in so yeah yeah, it definitely helps. I mean, it's funny too because if you think of like you know, to back to uh, Sovereign's question about if you just build a game, does that and publish it, does that count? Think of the guy who created a uh, Flappy Bird. You know, like I don't know, there was a video about him the other day on YouTube that was was in my recommended. Um, like he's just a solo developer. Didn't didn't from what I could tell, I don't really know. It didn't seem like he was involved in any communities. He just this guy was very prolific and just put out a. a bunch yep. of bunch of games one of them blew up and he made a lot of money and it's like well is he really in the game development industry like <laughs> not really i mean if uh, to be in the industry i think it, it's it's a whole it's it's a whole thing you know you know people you know you you contribute uh to the industry itself not just by creating games but you contribute by like making videos talking to people knowing people um so yeah yeah i think it is a little bit more than just making a game and publishing it Cool. I just saw that we got an alert. Oh, Daniel Carlin subscribed. Hey there. I don't know. I don't think I'm going to shout out every subscriber. <laughs> I'm still learning this live stream thing. <laughs> um, all right, cool. So some more questions. Let's see what we got. I, I like it. The chat's active. That's great. If anyone's uh, just now joining, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say to be sure to like this video and share it. <laughs> um, all right. Let me scroll up to the top. See, I've, I've been streaming with uh, Jason from Unity 3D College, and he usually handles the chat. So now I'm learning how to like, I, I got to read this thing now. <laughs> <laughs> Would you guys recommend any game design or Unity specific courses to enroll in or books to read? Um, I, I mean, 
game design. I know there's a, a good book, uh, game, um, Design Patterns for Game Development, I think is one of the, or game, or, I'm, I'm not sure what it's called. I'll look for it, but. Yeah, I think it's, got, it's game design, game design patterns, I think. It, it's definitely, it's free as well. Game programming patterns. That's the one. Yeah, game, game programming, program. yeah, yeah. And it was some variation of those words. <laughs> <laughs> and and general programming books are always helpful. Um, yeah, the, the, the kind of the, 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 the unhelpful answer is all of them <laughs> read everything <laughs> um the the kind of the, the more polite answer is have a look at what the highest rated courses are on the topics you care about on the major course platforms so i can honestly say uh without hyperbole i've i've watched hundreds and hundreds of hours of plural site i have watched every tutor that does something with c sharp at least one of their courses and i've watched every course by a number off the top of my head deborah carada Elton Stoneman, um, Zarin Harvat, I could start listing off uh, uh, tutors of courses where I've just consumed everything they've ever made because even some of the stuff is even like beginner design patterns. I've been doing design patterns for eight, ten years, but yes, I'm still watching a beginner design pattern course because it's a few hours of my day while I have my breakfast and there might be a nugget of something new in there. Um, as for uh, courses more to game stuff, uh, Udemy is definitely the better option if you're looking for Unity stuff. Um, plural side is better if you want raw C sharp stuff. If you want Unity stuff, uh, head over to Udemy, and I specifically uh, recommend Wilmer Lin. Wilmer Lin does amazing courses at Unity. He's, he's probably my favorite Unity specific course producer. Um, but there's there's so many options. Uh, books as well. Like there's so many ebooks. The one you mentioned earlier, game programming patterns. If you don't mind doing uh, reading C plus uh, plus, I recommend. Uh, game AI by example, although that's very specifically mm. AI, that might be a bit much. If you want to learn algorithms and fun stuff like that, there's Nature of Code um, uh, by Mr. Schiffman himself, which is a high recommendation. <laughs> so type in Coding Train. He's fantastic. Probably the best <laughs> tutor of, of anyone I've ever seen. There's just the answer is all everything. Just as much content as you can consume, as much free time yeah. as you have. Just Google it, find out what the best options are, and watch everything that's yeah that's all don't, I can say. don't get hung up either just you know find something and just dive in and and move on to the next thing and also another thing i'll, I'll mention is for uh go back and reread things you know even if it seems like oh i already know everything i know i think i think i already know everything there is to know about unit testing or design patterns it's there's something to be said about reading something and and, and seeing the theory behind it and the steps and then actually performing those steps running into walls you know bumping into walls um, and then going back and rereading, you you will be surprised at how much you didn't catch the first time, and and how much actually experiencing something that you're learning about um, provides more insight when you when you go and read about it again. Hundred percent. All right. Could you please type some of the names in chat? Oh, uh, I don't know if you want to drop some of those names in chat, Jason, of some of the uh, tutors and uh, uh, course creators. What yeah, what I'll do is at, at, at the end of our, our session here, I'm, I'm actually planning on doing this already. I'm going to make a resources document and I'm going to highlight a bunch of things I think people should see and I'll link it in, in both the Discord. So if you'd like to see the giant list of stuff for recommendations, <laughs> feel free to join the Infallible Code, Dis Infallible Code Discord and I'll have a link to probably about 50 different videos and places you should go to start with if you're to, if you're interested in this kind of stuff. And I can even put it in the description of this video, but definitely, uh, definitely yeah. join the Discord server because you know Jason's on there. We have a whole bunch of other folks like Vakarol who's in the chat. I'm sure there's a couple of other people in the chat uh, here that are active in our community, and yeah, we 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 love talking about this stuff. Um, I try not to miss any questions. Feel free to if you asked a question and I didn't catch it, uh, go ahead. You can repost it. I'm not gonna be angry about that. So let's see the the latest one. What are the pitfalls to using events? And what do you do uh, to replace events? Do you create singletons or public class object variables, then use the reference, then use to reference the class? What do you think about that? What do you think about events in general, the pitfalls? Yeah, see, this is one of those things where um, when, when you first start learning about software architecture, uh, I kind of find that it, it feels like every new tool you learn is like a new um, it's like a new tool in a tool belt, right? It's a new hammer or screwdriver or something. And you find yourself just desperately trying to find places to use it. <laughs> and <laughs> even then you start to see them as very separate things. You, you kind of, you, you don't, you don't conceptualize the fact that there's any relationship between a hammer and a screwdriver. They're two separate tools I've learned. I have events over here. I have the observer pattern over here. I have singletons over here. And these are the different tools in my belt. And I can only use the one if I need that one. 
Um, but as you start to kind of go further into this, you start to realize that software architecture is, it's an end goal, kind of, it's, it's not a tool. So the idea being that you are you are trying to make cleaner code by drawing good lines in your software. And so I could go into very specific detail about when I prefer to choose events versus when I prefer to use an observer or an event bus or something. But I think that that kind of misses the point of what the real heart of the question is, which is why should or shouldn't you use these? And I think the answer is more a case of if if you if you get into the habit of, of asking yourself the question, what am I trying to do rather than what does this tool do and how can I apply it? You can start to see that any one of them technically works and the pitfalls and benefits are entirely it's entirely down to what project you're working on. So I don't really concern myself with those issues. So, for example, mm -hmm. if I need to decouple two classes, I will use the first thing that comes to mind. Now, granted, from experience, I might have a better idea of which one I should use, but I don't dwell on the issue because as long as I decouple two things, I can then go back and change how I decouple them later, you know, because that's the point of already decoupled them. I can just choose what the messaging service is after the fact. So I don't I don't think that there's much value in, in sort of really clinically comparing two together. I think it's much more valuable to say, do you understand why it's there in the first place? Why do people even care about events? Why is it bad to couple things? And if you can just kind of internalize that idea and split up your code into logical chunks, you can pretty much just use whichever one you like and then learn more about the others and you'll you'll start to get a handle on what those differences are rather than just clinically writing them down. So a, a kind of a good example of this is if you go into collections and you start learning about how collections work, there's a lot of collections out there. Everybody knows lists, everybody knows arrays, but there's a lot more. There's array lists, there's hash maps, there's hash sets, there's... Um, there's even like concurrent lists. bags. There's concurrent, concurrent lists, lists, concurrent yeah. lists, yeah, the whole lot. And each one have different <laughs> pros and cons. And usually it comes down to um, the time, um, the logarithmic time for, for certain things. How long, how fast is it to read it? How fast is it to search it? How fast is it to get an indexed item? How fast is it to iterate them all? There's a whole load of different things. And they're very specifically benefits, pros and cons. But if someone said to me, should I use a hash map here or a link list? I'd be like... Just use a list for now, and then when the question comes up, when you're when you're optimizing, then you can go back and look at it later. And knowing the differences between these specifics is not going to make you a massively better programmer, because you, you can kind of delude yourself by spending a lot of time learning these micro optimizations when you're missing the point of a list is there as a generic concept of a collection to separate a collection of things from your code. And understanding how to draw a repository line there is 50 times more valuable than using the correct version of the right storage medium. So I would say just just look into architecture and play with it and don't don't get too bogged down about the specific of events versus calling get component versus using a singleton or a bus or whatever. That's not as important as understanding why you're drawing those lines and how to draw them well. Yeah, and it, and like you said, once it's decoupled, then you can go back and you can figure out how it is that classes communicate with each other later. Uh, what's important is the decoupling, because if once once it's coupled, if you if you write something that's coupled, it's way harder to to have to pull out and yank that out later on. Um, so something that's interesting, like uh, if you've ever seen like the Agile Manifesto, and I'm not talking about like Scrum and the corporatized version of Agile, but the the basic Agile. Uh, one of the things they say is is the decision you should make. You know, if if you're if you're at a decision point between two things, you should choose the thing that's easiest to change later. Um, mm. And the easiest thing to change is just by the fact that you've decoupled it. Uh, you know, you can go back and change whether you use events or or some other mechanism. You can easily change that later. Um, all right, cool. So I promised I'd get to this question. Uh, oh, I see Mateo's here. He's another one of our. Uh, Discord members, anyone in the chat who's just joining us and is not familiar with the channel, we have a Discord server, really active community. Uh, Jason, who I'm talking to, is active in that, and we've got a couple people in chat. Also, I'm just going to, I think I'm just going to drive this home the entire live stream. Be sure to hit that like button. I see we've got 39 viewers, 21 likes. Come on. What are you, what are you, what are you, what <laughs> guys doing? Go on, just click the button. <laughs> so here's another good question. Um, yeah. Programming is, uh, or is it, how do you guys organize your uh, code in the smaller parts so you have a nice fluid workflow? Oh yeah, and that's does, the question. And does going saying. down that, yeah, does going down that rabbit hole uh, lead you to get lost? Well, I'm gonna <laughs> say yes, it does sometimes, and I'll go into more detail later. But I want to hear your answer first, Charles. So how do you guys organize uh, your breaking down the application into small parts, basically? I well, mean, yeah, and how do you how do you avoid that being that nightmare of tiny little classes of frustration? <laughs> oh, yeah. well, I mean, 
uh, I mean, that kind of leads me to a thought about like the, the the single responsibility principle, how that's kind of abused to the point where you, you have these extremely tiny parts of your application. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's just about understanding uh, at any given point the, the, the functionality you're trying to implement. Um, where's the boundary between that functionality and other parts of your of your application or your, or your game? Um, and also, yeah, not breaking it up into things that are too small, you know, like the single responsibility mm-hmm. pattern. It, a, a single responsibility could be I'm just managing the player, and that could be a class that acts as a facade, if you're uh, familiar with the facade pattern. And its single responsibility is is doing everything that's involved with the player. And so you might think, oh, well, every little thing should have its own class, but you know, maybe not. Maybe maybe um, the single responsibility just includes a lot of, of, of logic. But, um, but yeah, I think it's like understanding your boundaries and not – over architecting and breaking things up into too tiny of responsibilities. Also, yeah. uh, one more thing on that is uh, a lot of people like to genericize early on. Maybe I'm getting a little too in, into the weeds, but uh, let yourself repeat things a couple times. You know, do the same thing. You know, the, the rule of three: uh, repeat it three times and then abstract it. You know, I, I find that's really helpful and and not um, not breaking things up too early on. Holy heck, we got a. Uh, I got my first um, super chat, <laughs> but before we get to that, why don't you uh, give your answer? Yeah, so so this, I'm gonna go on a little bit of a rant, as is probably no surprise to people who know me. But th- <laughs> this this particular topic is kind of close to my heart because I my my thing, what I've studied the most over the last X number of years that I've been programming, is software architecture. It's the topic I find most interesting, and because of that, I read everything I could about every architectural pattern and book and everything I could find, and that means. I felt obliged to write over-engineered and giant architected systems because I have all of this architectural knowledge. And I I did it wrong. I did it wrong for about four years. I just completely was over-engineering and making a mess of my code. And the reason why is because my interpretation of what what the architecture was for was for having all of these clean pockets of individual code where nobody ever talks to each other and it's all siloed and I can easily swap it out. That's That's not the way you should approach things. Because what happens is you start to see your entire – if you're really trying, you can turn every single string and every single int into its own system and architecture. You can. It's entirely possible, and that's a horrible idea. And so it took me a very long time to realize architecture emerges. It doesn't start. So there's a big debate mm-hmm. over do you start with your architecture or do you start writing the code that you want? And I think it realistically you should always start writing the code you need. That now – there's a that's kind of a that's an awkward statement simply because there is some cases where you're doing high level architecture but I'm going to say best practice for getting started write the code you need to write mm-hmm. and what happens is as your code grows you'll start to see things that kind of crop out or duplicate or whatever that's when you need architecture it's like I'm writing this multiple times maybe I'll take it out of and put it into a different class so w- when it comes to how do you avoid having tiny little pockets of code that are all horribly hard and nested to to work with well, you won't get that way if you don't start that way. If you start writing small, if you start saying, well, I'll need a repository and then I'm going to need a factory to, to provide my repositories, you're like, hang on a second. You haven't even written a line of code and you're already talking in design patterns. Design mm-hmm. patterns shouldn't be a language. Design patterns should be something that happens as you produce code. So what you should do is you should write some code and then when, when you need to create three of the same thing, put it in a class and start providing things with that class. It might be a pattern. You might actually have just accidentally made a factory, but don't name it factory. You've just moved the code out in a way that lets you now have things being replaced. So the answer is just write the code you need. Always aim to write the code that you need. Forget about architecture. Don't write a piece of architecture. Write a piece of code, and then you'll hit a point where you'll just know what feels wrong. You're repeating it, or it looks messy, or it's gotten too long. Then take it, put it in a separate class, and reference it, and your code will become architecture. Design patterns are a name for existing patterns people already use. They are not a collection of, you know, things you're supposed to find slots for in your application. If I can look at your code and I can tell six design patterns, you're already doing it wrong. <laughs> like, you, you should be able to look at someone's code and say, oh, I see what this is doing. This is clean. Uh, what, what Bob Martin says is he says that the architecture of real buildings in the real world, um, they scream what they are. When you walk into a church, mm. it looks like a church. It's got church shapes. It's got a general, <laughs> it's got a, a layout for usage as a church. And likewise, you go to a supermarket, it looks like a supermarket. It doesn't look like 
you know, building template pattern five with, you know, the bathroom module and the, you know, the pillar. It's the people, <laughs> you don't, you don't make buildings like that and you don't make code like that. You write the code you need and it will naturally take certain shapes. Certain things will become factory, certain things will become providers or whatever. And it's, it's good to know what they are so you can discuss them with other people. And it's good to know what they are so you can see, oh, hang on a second, this is turning into a provider or this is turning into a command pattern. Maybe I should formalize it a bit more. But you shouldn't start by saying, how do I fit a command pattern into my project? And that's, it's a major, and this isn't easy. Like it took me four years to get to that mentality. So it, it's a hard thing to do. Like it's going to take some time to sort of fight your urge to say, I have all these design patterns. How do I glue them together to build a project? <laughs> you have to approach it from the case of, I have code to write. How do I write that code? You know? So it's yeah. tough. It's not, it's done. we're here literally to answer questions to help with that, but it is a tough <laughs> process. I agree. And you touched on something I was going to say too. And like, it, it really just takes experience. You need to put yourself into positions where you're going to have to make these decisions and it's going to take a long time, but eventually, you know, you're, you're going to be able to maybe see ahead of time what design pattern you will probably use. But I mean, as long as you think in terms of what's the code I need to write, that the patterns, the architecture is just going to emerge from that. I never heard of that thing about uh, art, like real world architecture, like a church looks like a church. That's, that's brilliant. I like that. Mm. <laughs> um, it's funny too. If you, if you read, you know, the, and I, and I recommend this book, the design pattern book by the gang of four, they talk about how they came up with those. And, and basically they talked to a whole bunch of software developers who've been in the industry for years. And, and they said, Hey, look, you know, this sort of code that we were writing here, we've seen it a bunch of different times. Why don't we stick and slap a name on it and give it a sort of definition. And that, that's just how a design pattern patterns born. It doesn't happen first, you know, like the chicken before the egg, the design pattern comes after it's been done so many times that you can define it as a pattern. That's what a pattern is, right? You know, <laughs> it's a pattern that, you know, it's already being done. All right. So um, I want to, oh yeah, go ahead. Let me just say just one last point on that. So there's, there's different kinds of people at different stages of their programming education, I guess. If you're the kind of person who feels like I get a handle on design patterns and they're really cool and I'm trying to find uses for them and I want my code to look really enterprise, uh, my suggestion to you is the way you, the way you move to the next level of whatever you're doing is to pause learning either patterns or architecture and start learning refactoring. So there's a couple of books like Martin Fowler's uh, mm. Refactoring, um, and there's a load of great tutors. My personal favorite on this topic in particular is Zarin Harvat on Pluralsight. But basically, learn how to take an existing messy code base and convert it into clean code, because what you'll find is that's where you'll learn the difference between starting and generating stuff by stacking patterns versus finding emergent patterns in code and making things clean. So if you really want to get better at that idea of how many patterns should be in my project, how how much architecture should there be, the answer is learn how to find it as opposed to learn how to add it. And the best way to do that is to look at examples of existing messy code bases and see how much cleaner they can get by extracting things out and by moving things into organic patterns that are actually helpful rather than applying patterns. So. Yeah. Just learn to refactor is generally the goal. I wish there was, I know there's like a, like daily programmer or daily programming, I think on Reddit and they give you like uh, every day they give you a different uh, challenge to, to write. I wish they had like a daily refactor where like you just <laughs> got access to like a really ugly monolithic script and then, and then you just had to refactor it and then you could put that up. Maybe I want to make that subreddit daily refactor. Someone, someone make that subreddit. Yeah, nice. <laughs> That'd be kind of cool. Daily refactor. You just you just get this big ugly set of classes or or whatever, and uh, yeah, you just have to refactor, and everyone just shares what they came up with. There, there was a subreddit. There's a, a Stack Overflow group that I'm a part of that I occasionally jump into called mm. Code Review. So it's Code Review mm. Stack Exchange, and it's really fun because it's people who post code that works. You go to Stack Overflow if you're posting code that doesn't work. You go to uh, the, the code review stack exchange if you want to post code that does work but you want help on making it better and cleaner and it's great to have a load of people all work together to to uh to to try to architect and improve your your code it's it's, it's fascinating because you get to help other people out and you get to sort of work on ways to improve their code and there's it's, it's a good little community so that's a great one there's challenging there's code challenges for how do you write certain kinds of things and um yeah I used, to, I used to love that. I used to love answering people's questions there and helping them with making their code um, just a bit more easier to work with. So. Oh, this is great. Yeah, I'm on there right now. At, uh, dude, I'm going to check this out. Very cool. 
And we actually, uh, for those of you who don't know, we have a Discord community. Um, there's a link in the description of this video, and we do actually have a code review um, channel that is pretty active. I've seen a lot of people post their code. So, yeah, go over there and post your code, and, um, yeah, we can help you out and learn together. All right, so let me get to the super chat question. Um, if I have an int that I want to expose in the editor, but I also want other scripts to both read and write to it, should I just make it public or should I make it a serialized private field and also create a property for it? So uh, That, that last one, that's what I do. But I guess, uh, what about you, Charles? Yeah, I, that last one too. It's funny, you know, you said something a, a couple streams ago um, that you only have public... Maybe I'm misquoting you, so you can let me know. But you only put public uh, properties in DTOs, data transfer yeah. objects. And it's, it's, yeah. What do you think about that? Like, can you, well, do you think of a, a mono fact, behavior? Public fields. Like, I want to be very explicit here. Mm. I only use public fields in DTOs, and that's basically things without getters and setters. But I I use public properties that are read only in Unity scripts, and I use private serialized fields. But I will obviously have public getters and setters in normal C sharp scripts. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, yeah. Yeah, feel uh, it, that was something that, like, I just had never heard articulated, but, you know, thinking about my own c code and it's like, yeah, I, I, I only ever put public fields. It's just, it's almost strange to me. And I think if you do it, even Ryder, like, has a little squiggly under there that says, hey, do you want to turn this into a, a property? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> even it's like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> yeah, because cause at the end of the day, right, the, the main... If people are wondering what's the point of having the difference between a public int versus a private serialized int or something, is if it's if it's a public variable um, and everyone else is using it and you ever want to change that implementation. So say, for example, you want to provide it from a different location or you want to bind to something different or you want to override a class and it gets changed to a different variable under certain conditions. You just can't do that. You will have to edit every script that references that variable because the type of variable it is has been locked down to saying this is very publicly exposed as an int. If you're using a getter or any other accessor method or if you want to be really specific about it, accessors and mutators are just sugar in terms of C sharp. But if you're more classically from a Java background, they're fully qualified accessors and mutators. So it's get age, mm -hmm. set age, very explicit methods to access those variables. And the benefit of that is you may not know what validation you want now, but inevitably at some point you'll want validation. So if I have a health field and I just expose it and people can set the health, um, I can never decide to make sure health can never be less than zero without fundamentally changing a lot of code to make sure that that's supported. If I just have a set health function, I have the same feature available to me. And even though I haven't decided yet what the validation is, I can just write one if statement above that line and say only set the health if it's greater than zero. So it, it's the main point of having these sorts of lines between what's private and what's public is you can decide which of these things are important to you as as the project grows and you're basically sticking within the open close principle. If it's public, you don't just have to change the class that you're in, you might have to also change the classes that are listening to it. So if you change the float to an int or something, you'd have a lot of work going around and changing all of those places everywhere else. But you can do things like casting and stuff, which will be a lot easier to manage internally inside of a single class. So it's giving you freedom and it's drawing a finer line between what two things are. And a similar approach to this is the same we said about um, collections. There's a reason why most mm -hmm. architecture suggests you return a collection as an I enumerable. Because it may be a list right now, but it might be an array later when that's more efficient. Or it might be um, a set if you want something that has to have uh, no duplicate entries. And the decision you make to decide something is a set instead of a list or instead of a whatever, that shouldn't ripple through your code and affect 50 things. You should be exposing the fact that I have... I have a collection of things. It is just a collection. I have 10 things here. You can look at them. And how I choose to manage and maintain those things is up to me relative to my requirements right now. I might need them to be fast to read or I might need them to be fast to access. But that decision shouldn't require you to rewrite 10 files that all reference, you know, the public collection of type list and change the way, change the fact that you have to use array index or syntax or now it's a set. So I have to, or now it's a dictionary. So I have to call, <laughs> um, add a uh, key or something. And it's like, I shouldn't have to make those changes in all of my scripts because one guy decided he wants to move from using an array to a dictionary or something. So that's all that all this architecture is. 
is don't expose details that are irrelevant to everyone else's workflow. And that kind of gets in the law of the meter and all that stuff, but I don't want to go yeah, down a, yeah. down, <laughs> I was down a giant say. rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, and it's, that's why it's important to, when you're writing a class, you really need to focus on the what. Like, what is it going to do? What is the interface that you're going to expose? What is it responsible for? And, you know, if you think of something like, for instance, an inventory, Obviously, inherently, it's going to have some sort of list or collection of, of objects, you might say, because it's an inventory. That's what it holds. It holds a collection of all the, the player's objects. But that doesn't mean you want to expose that list to be editable. You know, when you add to the inventory, you're not going to want to call inventory.items.add. No, you want to expose some method uh, that allow on the inventory. So you would just call inventory.add item. And at that point, who cares internally what's going on? For all you know, it could be, I used this joke yesterday in Jason's uh, Unity 3D college stream, it could be sending a note to a, a carrier pigeon that flies at a, you know, to a chicken coop where it keeps track of all the items in, a, you know, in your inventory. Who knows? The, what's important is you expose an interface that says, hey, whoever, whoever's a client of this inventory class, I'm letting you add to it using this, this method. And, and, and that's all and, that really matters. And a very good example of this, right, is I literally had this scenario where I built an inventory system. And all it was was it just takes in a list of objects, adds to it, adds to the list, and stores them. And that was fine, and it worked. And I was using, just like Charles was saying, I had an add function on my inventory class. What did it do? Well, it just called an internal list and called dot add on it. So it may have seemed redundant to anybody looking at it, going, why are you just having an add function that calls an add function that doesn't do anything? Well, because later on, a requirement I got for that project was... Um, there was kind of a, a achievement system for have you carried enough stuff or if you carried X amount of things, you get an achievement for it. And so to do that, all I had to do was whenever something was added to the inventory in the backpack, I just incremented the size. I just added the size of the item in that add function. And so because I did that, it didn't really impact me negatively. I could just write one line of code in one place and then all of a sudden I have a new feature because it's, it's a thing that hooks into the add concept and I didn't expose how I was adding. I exposed that an ad request came in. So it, it's yeah. just drawing that line between does anybody else really need to know how I add or do they just know that an inventory can add? Yeah, that, that encapsulation. I mean, that's one of the that's I mean, think of object oriented programming. That's the power. I mean, you you encapsulate these things and, and, and that way you don't have to worry about it later. Uh, refactoring and all that. Um, all right, cool. So I'm looking at the chat here. Just wanted to see. I saw something that uh, made me laugh. Um, someone was talking about how the new C sharp. Um, I'm sorry. The the new mathematics library that they added in Unity is 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 killing the C sharp naming conventions because it's all lowercase. Oh, is it? All the all the all the method calls are lowercase. Like, man, that drives me crazy. Why would they do that? <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's funny how that is, though, you know, with languages and conventions, mm -hmm. how like they almost feel like like law, you know, you know, you could you could be crazy and name your air, your private member variables M underscore whatever. Ugh, yeah. I don't know why that, you would do that. That's my least favorite of all of, of all of the different <laughs> styles of, you know, of annotating your code. We, we just we just don't need it anymore. There's just no need to have your M underscores on things. It's, it's insanity to me. Or it's int like, yes, I guess underscore. Yeah, I get that it's a member variable, but you don't need to specifically say it's a member variable. But yeah, <laughs> someone says, uh, "Sunny Valley Studio says, how do you get the intuition to know when to use design patterns?" And I think it's what you were saying earlier, Jason, that you know, design patterns, the architecture will emerge. Um, yeah. Obviously, you need to be coding a lot and writing things and implementing things, and in that, you will gain experience. You know, and that experience is very helpful in understanding when you should you know, use a design pattern, but, um, yeah, you should just write the code you need and the design pattern will reveal itself. The tool you'll need to use will reveal itself when the problem is clear. Yeah. Cause kind of the, the much shorter answer to the long version I gave earlier is the fact that there's a certain point in writing code where using your own code is annoying. It's just true. You're writing this dot, this dot, this, this is a pain in the ass. Why am I doing, or, you know, the code just looks messy and it's hard to work with. Like the point of all of this other than to, to make a project scalable, is to make it easy to work with. And if you're having a hard time working with your own code, that's a good indication that you could probably do with some tidying. So it's not, it doesn't need to be some sort of grand, you know, eureka moment where you have a sudden, I know I should just split this in multiple classes. If you're using your own code and you're not enjoying writing your code, you've either A, 
need more more need more architecture to split up stuff that's big and messy, or is often very true the case, and sometimes it's hard to admit it. You've over engineered to the point that working with your own code base is a pain in the ass, and you hate it. You prefer it before you did all of the architecture, and if you're hitting okay. that stage, it means you're thinking in design patterns and you're not just writing the code that should be done. So every line of code should add value, and so if you're not adding value, then there's no point in writing that extra bit of code. So yeah, it's it's not going to be it, it's not like a sudden you know bolt of of inspiration that'll tell you when to do it. It's more a case of does this feel wrong in general, and and things will feel more wrong, and you'll know when things are wrong more often the more you do it. But you should get a good sense already just by writing code and going, is this annoying to work with? If the answer is yes, then where did I see code I liked? So what I do is I use other people's libraries. I will download a library from someone else. I will see how they use it, and I'll go, damn, I really like this library. This is really easy to work with. And then I'll look at what they did, and I'll take inspiration from it. So is there code you enjoy working with? If there is, look at what they did. Is there code you don't like working with? Look at what they did and don't do it. That's pretty much it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and and, and the more you know, the more you expose yourself, the more you're going to learn things. And, and yeah, one way to expose yourself is to look at other people's code. I think it's very valuable. And that's a pretty good point, you know, that you make when you start to get sick of your own code. That's when you know, yeah. I, I'm kind of getting there with my this little inventory that I've been writing. Like, mm. I'm at this point where I'm like, I think I've over architected it and I feel it, you know, in, intuitively. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I've, yeah. I've done that. I've entirely thrown away systems. I, I've written entire, uh, I wrote a system for debug drawing in Unity. So you could generate uh, gizmo shapes. And you could generate all sorts of different shapes of spheres and, and circles. And then you could have composite shapes where you draw arrows by composing circles and our triangles and, and circles and then lines and stuff. And it's really powerful. <laughs> you can do a million <laughs> things. You can provide different drawers. So it'll draw as a uh, gizmo draw or it'll draw as line renderers, all sorts of really cool features that one, I never used. <laughs> and two, it just, every time I wanted to draw a shape, I had to write like eight lines of composing code. And I went, you know what? You, you've ruined this, Jason. You've overdone it. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> let's be 100% honest here. If you don't want to use it, why would anybody else want to use it? And sometimes you just have to be honest with yourself. And I said, okay. So I went back to the drawing board. I wrote down, what do I want my code to do? I want to be able to draw arrows in uh, in my debug lines in Unity. And so I wrote a thing that let me draw arrows. And I said, well, sometimes you also want to be able to write draw a sphere to, to represent a point. So I did a draw point. And I ended up with 10 lines of code that did what I needed rather than the you know, AT class monster that I originally had. Because it's sometimes you just do it wrong. That's just, you have to be honest with yourself and you have to go back and ask yourself, are you adding value? If you're not adding value, then you're doing it wrong, you know? Yep. Yeah, it's, it reminds me of uh, this, a video that I actually scrapped completely, thanks to Jason. Um, <laughs> I wrote a uh, str uh, that's a string extension library that basically, you know, you can write a string and call dot color or dot bold and, uh, and, and you know it would it would uh, pad the text with rich text tags, um, and I did a whole video on it. And I in, at the end of the video, I was filming myself doing this tutorial. I was like, "Well, this looks ugly." Like this, is, like the first time I ever really used it was while I was recording the tutorial. And I was like, "All right, let's let's replace this uh, this text with with my string extension library." And I did it, and I was like, "Wow, this looks awful! Like this is terrible!" <laughs> and I totally scrapped the entire video. Jason saw it, and he's like, "Dude, you did this whole tutorial, and at the end, you said it was useless." <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, you're right." Yeah, so, I, I specifically said, I said, do you enjoy using this code? And he's like, no, not really. <laughs> and it's like, well, then don't don't put it out there because if you don't like it, that's the point, right? You're not you're not making code you would want to use. So. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. <laughs> that was a fun realization. But yeah, but yeah, you're always still learning, man. That's kind of the thing, right? Like, there's no there's there's no sort of uh, you don't reach the zen of software architecture and you write perfect code every time, but you just have a better understanding of when you're going down the wrong garden path. You know, that's all it is, is the more you read on it, the more you write code, the more you get a handle on what you're doing, you'll sort of ebb and flow in how much you want to engineer and over engineer and, and you know, under engineer. And it's just, it's never just a one static thing. And I used to be the guy who massively over engineered, like hugely, I would write giant, giant systems. Now mm -hmm. I'm, I try my best not to, and I, I make, I, my instinct is still to over engineer, but I force myself to remember that every line of code I write is either ticking off a box of a feature that I need to add, or it's there because I'm about to add something else and it would be cleaner if I did this first. Mm -hmm. I don't write that stuff 
necessarily need it, barring a few cases with unit testing. When you're unit testing, sometimes you can preempt the way architecture needs to go to make it testable, but that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> but for the most part, I don't put in architecture until there's already a need for it, you know? Yeah, and I think like, I think that's what you get with experience. You you get you get this level of comfort that you don't really have as a newbie, you know, because it, it can be kind of daunting. I, I, I don't like that word newbie, by the way. I, I can't think of a better <laughs> word. I, I, a new developer. Um, I know for me, it's like it's daunting to think that I'm writing this piece of code and I'm making a decision about, you know, do I make it a list or, you know, a dictionary or whatever. And I just don't know the impl- the implications and it's scary to think that what if I make the wrong choice and what if I don't develop this whole thing and, 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 and it was wrong and I have to go and I, and, and re or uh, refactor it. And I, you know, eventually mm-hmm. you do that enough that you become comfortable saying, you know what, I'm going to make a decision here and I know that I might have to come back to it, but I have enough experience to know that it's okay. Um, and, and you also become more comfortable not exactly implementing design patterns and, and just writing code and maybe repeating yourself and not being dry all the time because you, you've done it a hundred times and you know, hey, I can always just go back and I can make it dry later if I really need to because you just know how to maneuver you know, more effectively when you're writing yep. code. And, and the other thing too is that I don't think a lot of people really internalize this, but it, it's kind of it's, – it's like when you're working on a project and people say the old classic – of it can be uh, fast, cheap, or good, pick two. Mm -hmm. Um, And people don't realize this, but software is kind of, it's got its own little kind of um, trade-off system, whereby your code can either be easy to read and clean, it can either be really hyper-efficient, or it can be modular and easy to share. And oftentimes, those three things do not work together. And sometimes you can only pick one of them. Because if you if you put a lot of architecture in to make code modular and like automated and dynamic and use reflection to build stuff, you're not going to be able to easily read that. You're going to be passing in, you know, activators into builders to create factories so that it can all dynamically generate. And that's really cool, but it's going to be really hard to read. And it sure as hell is not going to be efficient. But you can end up going the other way and going the Unity thing when you write really efficient code, um, like with the new dot stuff. I think it's a new name now. Is it dots it's still? I forgot what they've called it now. Um, but you can use hyper-efficient code, and then your code's going to be really hard to read, and it's also going to be kind of um, very hard to add and modularly add features to. So all three of them are separate concerns, and they're constantly at war. So you can't – there's mm-hmm. not the perfect architecture. It's not like I finally did it. I found the right way to do a UI system in Unity because depending on your needs – it can be heavily architected or it can be lightly architected and it boils down to whatever your use case is. And the only real advice I give to people on how to do that is to figure out what it is you're actually trying to do. It sounds obvious, but find out what your goal is. Make that your actual objective. Are you trying to make something fast or are you trying to make something modular? Are you going to reuse this or are you going to be making something efficient? And if you can really think about that, you can start to write the code that works better for what you need, you know? Yeah. Mert here says, uh, welcome to the stream, by the way. He says, uh, Lean, uh, a friend of his calls it lean code rather than clean code because code could be written clean but does stuff in an unnecessary way or an oddly complex way. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, lean code. I like that. I've heard a, I've heard a similar thing where they call it uh, avoid clever code. Clever code is all the stuff that makes you feel really uh-huh. smart for writing it but is sort of – Oh, yeah. You know it's over-engineered. You know you're doing it because it's cool but you're not actually getting value out of it. I had a period where I would just try to write like one-liners. I mean, yeah. you think of like code golf, it's kind of the same thing, but code golf, yeah. you just do it for fun. You're not really supposed to do it for production code. Yeah. <laughs> if you ever find yourself using a ternary operator into a ternary operator, pause, step away from your computer, and take a deep breath, <laughs> and then realize you should rethink a lot of decisions <laughs> you're making. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Well, um, we've been going on for over an hour now. It's been very good. Um, I don't know, maybe we'll go for a couple more minutes and answer some last minute questions if anyone has them. And uh, yeah, I think this is something that uh, Jason and I were talking about. We want to try to do this regularly. Um, you know, we've been talking about live streaming and, you know, sometimes it's not very valuable for me to just sit here and code an inventory so you can watch me do that and because it's so specific. And, you know, so what, what I think we want to do moving forward is have these Q&As. Um, and I think even have maybe some code reviews and obviously have the code editor open just in case we need to uh, illustrate, um, you know, an example. Like if we're talking about a design pattern, we can just t- type it up real quick. But um, yeah, expect to see these live streams 
maybe on a weekly basis. What do you think? Weekly basis? Yeah, I, I think we could do that, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not really stuck on a particular day uh, just yet. We might get to that point where we're saying, hey, it's going to be every Tuesday at this time. Uh, but uh, just for the meantime, keep an eye out. Join our Discord server. I always blast it out on Discord, and I will put it on Twitter too, so if you follow me on Twitter. Also subscribe with the notifications on. You'll get a notification directly from YouTube. Um, make sure you put a like, a like on this video. A like? What's that? Put a like on this video. And uh, another thing that super helpful for supporting the channel um, is to share this video on Twitter or social media um, just because it just helps with YouTube. You know, they see shares and they, you know, they, they, they want to put it out on the recommended page. So I think this is going to be super valuable for I, I game developers. I believe you're about to say uh, smash that like button or smash notification. Smash that button. like, hell yeah, hey, man. Uh, uh. <laughs> smash that like button, ding that bell. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, we want to make sure that we're providing value to you guys, uh, you know, game developers, that's the community that we are we are passionate about. So yeah, I see someone says uh, plus one to code reviews and refactors. I think that'd be fun. So I think yeah, for the I next one, pr uh, prepare some code reviews. Um, I think the best way to do it would probably be like a paste bin or a gist. So if you want to get those ready, um, next time we stream, just uh, we'll, we'll have to remember to ask about that and you can drop a link and we'll take a look at it. Um, all right, so I see a question here. Oh, anything you want to say about this, Jason, before I answer a couple, we answer more questions? I know you want to start a YouTube channel. I don't know if you uh, want to talk, talk about that, if that's a big secret or something. <laughs> no, no, well, no, it's not not secret just yet. It's just, uh, as people might be able to see, my office is not exactly set up at the moment. There's just a few games consoles and boxes behind me. Um, hmm. My, I'm, I will, I will be making a, a YouTube channel some stage in the future, but I've, I've got a, I'm between work and currently renovating my office, things are a little bit busy, but in a couple of weeks, if, if we're going to keep doing this, uh, I might finally have a place to send people. So soon, soonish, we'll put it that way. Very cool. All right. Um, let's see some questions. How about live code architecture design where you take some example given by a user and you do some semi pseudo code that explains best architecture for given context. Could be something. I, I saw Jeremy's asking, um, please explain determinism. Now, that's okay. a real question if you're talking about philosophy or you're talking about code, because they are very different and very, I could go on a rant about both. But I, <laughs> I guess in general, um, a deterministic code will repeat the same cycle given the same inputs. So if you write something, uh, even with a random, you may think you're using a randomizer, but a random seed would allow you to produce the same outcome given the same random seed next time. So you take a world like Minecraft, Minecraft generates your code, but it generates it randomly to a certain specification. So given the same random seed, you can expand infinitely and create new environments. So if your code is deterministic, it means you can guarantee that you'll get the same exam the same uh, outcomes every time you run it. And that that's, can be very important depending on what you're doing because you'd often get, you, you'd think you can do that consistently, but it's surprisingly hard um, to ensure that you'll get the exact same. Like for example, time, time is one of those factors that will massively change up your code. A good example of this is if you ever played um, old uh, NES or SNES code, or as a kind of, say, the old the old console games, played the old Super Nintendo or an old, um, which you have one over there somewhere. But if you played old games, you'll often see the whole thing where they run really fast. They run like super, super fast on your machine hmm. because that code, that, is, that isn't deterministic because what's happening is depending on the time scale value you're providing, it's changing up the values because it's, 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 not, it's not deterministic as an experience, but the code will be deterministic because given the same time values, it'll run at the same speeds. But yeah, so long story short, determinism in code is so that you can guarantee to get the same outputs. And to, to do that, you can you can do things like, the best example would be like No Man's Sky. They don't create all of that content. They create seeds that can be consistently generated on your local machine. So everyone's actually running the same simulation and actually generating it locally. There's not a server filled with that game. It's all locally on your machine. And as you press forward, it gets generated in real time. So the world is infinite, but it doesn't exist until you step into it and it's generated. And it can generate reliably exactly the same way for you as it does for your friend because both systems use the exact same deterministic code. Same thing with like uh, Minecraft, you can share a world seed. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, Axel asked if this would be uploaded. Is This is, this will be uploaded. Uh, in fact, I think it auto uploads uh, like once we're done streaming. So um, that, yeah, please, please share this video. Make sure you drop some likes on this. Um, it will go up on the channel. 
Also, I, uh, for those of you who don't know, I just uploaded a video on Thursday. Um, so if you haven't seen it, please give that a watch and a like and a share as well. So, yeah. Oh, and um, uh, Sonny asked, asked a question here. Um, is it a good way to load scriptable objects from a folder instead of placing uh, instead of placing them on a list and a mono behavior? Hmm. This is this is a contentious point, which <laughs> I want to be really careful on. Um, Unity themselves are telling people no longer to use resource.load. So wow. going forward, it is not the way to do things. I, didn't I know used that. to say yes. I used to enjoy it. It's really cool to be able to just reference a folder and load things up. But they are they are fundamentally changing the way they're doing resources. So the answer is right now, I don't know what the best way to do that is, simply because Unity are still playing with their solution for it. Um, whenever it's text data, I tend to literally just use um, the, the system uh, file I.O. stuff. But if it's like scriptable objects and that kind of data, uh, or even any any prefabs at all, favor not using resource loading at the moment, especially if you're on mobile devices because there can be hitches and performance issues right now. They will be changing it. They have a much more efficient method going forward, which is kind of, it's not asset bundles, but it's like a newer, I forgot the name of it, uh, uh, Jason, uh, other Jason, I guess I'm Jason now, uh, <laughs> other Jason is, did a video on this topic on what Unity's new approach to, to loading assets is. But right now, wherever possible, if you if you're going to be using a project going forward, addressables. Thank you, addressables. Is the name of it. Oh, so it's a new right. addressable yeah. system. Yeah. So that's the new way Unity is leaning towards doing loading assets. But until that's really locked down, I highly recommend, where possible, to just drag things in in a scriptable object. And it's very it, complicated right now. The, the yeah. whole setup process of the addressables. It's cool, but really complicated. And and if you want sort of a sneaky half and half way, which is what I actually do, I will make a scriptable object that will contain a list of the scriptable objects in my project. And I will drop that scriptable object into my uh, mm. mono behavior, and I will use that as a repository. So for example, you've got a load of inventory items, you put those items into something called a shop or an item collector or something, and you now have one scriptable object that you can drop into your mono behavior and reference all of your items that you need with the same gets and searches and all that stuff. And it, it's it's halfway there. It keeps it. You don't have to keep rebuilding your list every time you move something, but you also don't have to deal with the memory performance issues of loading stuff in. Yep. Cool. So I'm trying to fix that link uh, that Tommy mentioned. So just keep an eye out for that. I'm gonna. I'll probably fix it after the stream. Um, so yeah, I think this was great. Um, I'll, I'll have another. This this will go up live after we end this. Um, and I'll look out for another video on Thursday. And then look out for another stream. We're gonna try to do this weekly. Um, it's Sunday, so and I know I'm going out of town this weekend coming up. So I think this will be the stream for this week. So look for another stream uh, following the next weekend. Um, so yeah, I think this was great. Thanks, thanks everyone for joining. Any closing thoughts, Jason? Uh, well, I'll answer one last question because it just popped yeah, up again. Right. I've, seen, I've seen it a few times. Uh, the question is, what exactly is .NET? So mm. .NET is Microsoft's answer to writing code universally across multiple uh, platforms. So C# -sharp is a language, R# -sharp is a language, but C# -sharp, R# -sharp, and VB.NET, as all separate languages can all be compiled and used in a .NET environment. So the idea is if you're writing in .NET code, you can anywhere, you can basically, you can write a line of code which reads a VB line of code from your C-sharp application and vice versa with R-sharp. So if you wanna do, um, if you wanna write code in different languages, they can all talk to each other by using some interop different features. And this goes even one step further, there's .NET Core, which is a, a rewritten version of .NET and that one deploys even on Linux. So it's it's a much leaner version of all of the languages that effectively has a universal set of libraries that work together. So to, to be very specific about that, there is a certain way that VB handles files. It has its own code written in VB to handle files. There's a certain way C Sharp handles files and it writes its own code and does that. But if you use, uh, if they all supported by the .NET framework. So if you if you choose a .NET framework version that they all have a matching part to, that is literally an example of encapsulation. So what happens is, no matter which one you use, you can say get files and so on, and it'll it'll work on any platform across the different ones that it supported, because the .NET framework is a framework that consists of all of the languages. So yeah, it's it's universal runnable code, and it's it's actually a really good example of native. Uh, design pattern and architecture because it's literally using the ability to have polymorphic calls between different languages. So yeah, framework is a framework of languages. Cool. 
Um, I just answered a question in the, in the chat. <laughs> it was about MMOs. I didn't want to trigger you. Um, so, yeah, I'm sorry. So, I, I'm never going to answer MMO questions because I, I, <laughs> I might have I might have a giant video rant one day that lasts 20 minutes about why I think asking, even mentioning the word MMO in Unity is a bad idea. But until that day, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm never going to answer MMO questions. <laughs> but uh, I w- I'm going to share the screen because the the – the question asker had asked if it was a good idea or, or have any tips about creating an MMO for the something called the Decade Jam. I'm looking at it now. It looks like there's a game jam that's literally a decade long. <laughs> that's such a well, gimmick. It would, have to, it would have to be if you're making MMOs, I guess. Yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> what a gimmick, man. <laughs> the 10-year game jam. That's hilarious. Starts that's, in a month. The, uh, okay, if, I guess. <laughs> I'm gonna wait till uh, the like the last possible minute. I'm gonna make a Flappy Bird clone. Maybe in ten yeah. years, no one will remember it, and it'll be seem like an original idea. I'll, I'll, to be honest, I'll say uh, I I was having a look at taking part in the the one that uh, Brackies and Saiku and um, Blackthorn Broad did recently. Their kind oh, of community community channel. Thank you. Um, and I was like, I, I ended up having a bit of free time. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to really take part. I had like two or three days, and that was a week long. A week is a very long time for a game jam. Like the whole nature of what a game jam is is about writing really quick code to solve problems and prototype ideas. A week is a very long time <laughs> for a game jam. So yeah, <laughs> this, this wouldn't be my kind of thing, to be honest. That's awesome. Yeah, well, speaking of game jams, you didn't hear it from me, but uh, I hear the guy who does infallible code is thinking about hosting one. So Ooh, interesting. Keep an eye out. I've got some really cool prizes. I can't actually. Hold on. Give me a second. Yeah, while well, you're doing that, I'll just say, I don't want to go into massive detail about the MMO thing, but I will say one thing. Ask yourself, what is your favorite indie MMO? What is your favorite one-man-teamed MMO? And if you can't come up with four off the top of your head, that are, then that might explain to you why I don't think MMOs should be made. Not in Unity specifically. My problem isn't with MMOs in Unity. It's that most people who ask to make an MMO haven't made a game yet or if they, even if they have made a game they haven't made a game to scale or they haven't made a multiplayer game or they haven't made a game which has to balance uh statistics for numbers and values and for managing that kind of thing like each one of these is its own concern and if you're going to say i'm making an mmo you're saying i'm going to put on the hat of 50 different people's jobs and i'm going to manage all of it and it's going to be my first project that's that's saying I'm going to build the Sistine Chapel for my very first ever building project. Instead of building a birdhouse, you're going to start with that. It's an insane choice to make. So yeah, just don't do it. Just don't make an MMO <laughs> first. That's what my mind. Yeah. So I wanted to show this. I, I have a contact at uh, JetBrains, the the people who create Writer, and he sent me this box. I have a whole box of T-shirts of Writer T-shirts. I don't know if you can see that. Um, but yeah, so I have a whole box of them and I also have a bunch of pins and he also gave me some codes. Uh, one, I think one code for, uh, I think a year long license for writer. Um, he gave me all these pins as well. So I have all this swag and I was thinking, well, I can do a giveaway. Um, and I might actually do a giveaway on, on our, our live streams here for some of these shirts cause I have so many, but I was thinking about doing a game jam and giving out. Uh, rider swag and some codes, some promo codes. I have, uh, I think, a year, like I said, a year-long uh, subscription year, a promo code, and I think I have a couple six-month um, extended uh, trials. So keep an eye out for that. I'm working on it. Um, nice. Maybe beginning of next year, I'll have something where I can put it out, or maybe sooner. I don't know. I'm just been so busy. Uh, well, you know, I, I can't help it because the, the chat's still talking about MMOs. I'm going to go on one last little bit. All right, all right, all right. So, so, <laughs> so my first bit was to say why I don't think you should make one. Because most, to be honest, you probably don't have the experience. I don't have the experience to make an MMO. And I've been doing this for a relatively long time. I would never suggest someone start by making an MMO. Even if you did. Even if you decided, okay, I have the experience. I'm going to make an MMO. Let's talk realistic numbers here. People, people don't realize that. Think about what an MMO is, right? An MMO is a investment game. By nature, it's a game where you have to sit in it, spend time, and you're, you're looking to build a player base of consistent users. So you're not just competing against, it's like the mobile market, right? You're not just competing against a number of games that are in a similar space. Your game is only successful when you've got buy-in from a large collection of users. So if you're building a game that's multiplayer mostly only to work, and you're building a game that requires you to have a large, massively multiplayer in the title world, your game will be a failure if it isn't massively multiplayer, which means you are competing against everyone else who's trying to monopolize your time. And here's the thing. If you think you can do it, that's impressive. But think about the fact that Destiny as a game can't even do it. 
Destiny is competing against every other multiplayer online game like Division 2. These are huge corporations with a lot of money, and they cannot compete with each other because realistically people have only a set amount of hours per day, and they're going to spend their time on the game they like the most. If you're putting yourself inside of that space, you're making a game where you are trying to compete with people's time, you're not making it like in any game people can play for a few hours and enjoy it. If you're making an MMO, your game is only a success if people play it consistently and make it their main game. That's the nature of what it is. And you are up against every single one of them. You're up against The Division. You're up against, um, again, even Overwatch, all of these kinds of games. So you need to have a consistently large user base. There's the, the assets, the, the Steam store is littered with multiplayer shooters that are dead on arrival because their multiplayer online has less than three or four people in it. You cannot play a multiplayer shooter game if you've played a multiplayer 10, 10, 10 versus 10 team game and you can only get two or three people on your team. You don't need two or three people. You need to have thousands for your game to functionally be successful. So it, I'm not saying never make an MMO. I mean, if you have a big team and you have resources and you have funding and you have stuff, you can do it. But anybody who thinks they can do it with a team of less than 50 people and with an experience set of even still having to learn network code, each one of those things is a 10-year profession to learn how to do. So not even is it really hard to make. Even if you make it, you have a, such a high barrier to even consider it being a successful project. Compare all of this to making a fun uh, mobile game that takes you two months and has massive investment. The, the last thing I'll say on this is look at Flappy Bird. Flappy Bird is this, everyone talks about it as a success story. It makes tons of money. It's a really small game. He made like 20 games before that. And each one of his games took him less than three weeks to a month to make. His goal was make a lot of games for fun, and eventually one of them just happened to hit hit it big. If you spend five years building an MMO, investing all of your time and resources, and you don't have that much, you don't have as much money as Blizzard, and you don't have as much money as all of these Activision or other companies, you're going to have to c compete against them for the same audience, and it's just not going to be at that same scale. It's insanity. And, and you have to hit lucky once. That's like going to, that's like going gambling and playing only once. You know, you're rolling dice once and hoping you hit exactly the number you want versus make a bunch of small games, roll the dice 50 times, and you'll eventually get a good success. Because if you talk to any professional, whether you're talking to comedians or you're talking to uh, book writers, they will tell you the projects they put the most time and effort into are not the things people latch on to. They don't know what's going to be successful. It's going to be some random video you made that you didn't really care about too much, or it's going to be some random song you wrote, because you don't know, you don't choose what's successful. And if you decide to put all of your eggs in one basket, you're going to end up ruining yourself. You're going to spend all of your money, all of your time, and you'll have nothing to show for it. If you make... 10 small projects and you only invest as much as you need to, you are getting 10 times the chance to be successful. So I, I, this was going to be another video, but I can't help it. I just had to rant on it. Please, Listen, man, for, that was for your a, own sanity, don't make MMOs, please. That was a top notch <laughs> Jason rant. That was incredible. You know, Pete Jason rant right there. <laughs> listening to you rant just now made me think I need to do I need to cut this stream up into clips because I think that could be its own <laughs> clip why and I'm going to title it why you shouldn't create an MMO in unity or an MMO well, in general <laughs> well, well I've had that one building up for a while I've, I've needed to say that because I get I get asked that question a lot and I know it's coming from a good place people are asking I want to make an MMO I love MMOs I should make one and I 100% applaud your optimism that's a fun project and it'd be cool to do but you, you'll be much happier if you have a successful small game than you will having a partially finished unsuccessful MMO that you've been working on for six years. And I hate to say it to everyone who's saying to me, I'm making an MMO. I've heard that conversation 10 times a month for the last two years. Everyone is apparently is making MMOs when it's their first projects. And do you know how many of them I still hear from? Do you know how many MMOs I've played from these people? Zero. <laughs> There's a couple of them that are a couple of them are halfway through and they put a lot of work into it, but it's just not going to work. Like just for your own sanity, take a deep breath and realize, do you play one man MMOs? No. So, you know, don't try to make one that you wouldn't play it yourself. No. It almost seems like the best way to position yourself to make an MMO is either obviously already have a huge amount of capital and a huge company of, of people who can get together and you, you know that they can develop something or maybe like you can do what Star Citizen did is just make a really, really badass vertical slice, share it and get a whole bunch of money off of Kickstarter. And then even them, they didn't even they haven't even. No, made they, they, a successful they're currently not successful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and the thing is, right, if we even dial this back from MMOs, right, my advice to people who are making games in general, 
don't make a game for your first project. What you should do instead is you can do things like uh, level design. I think mm. most people, most people who professionally are level designers or are professionally game designers, they started by modding existing games. Learn mm -hmm. how to make a Minecraft mod. Learn how to make a Skyrim mod. Learn how to even just even just open up Portal 2 and use their really cool level creator and create custom puzzles and, and things in there. Or uh, in my case, it was Tony Hawk. I used to make a ton of Tony Hawk's levels and try to organize really cool layouts and stuff and study how games are made. Um, Mario Maker is a fantastic example. You learn so much about game development just by learning how to do good levels in Mario Maker. So you don't start by building the end result in anything. It's not just MMOs. MMOs just seems like the most outlandish example to me. But no matter what it is you're doing, dip your toe in and learn how to do it by using tools that are out there. Like I, I used to laugh when I was younger at Game Maker. Like game Maker is for children. Nobody could really make a real game with Game Maker. There are a lot of really commercial, high quality games out there made in Game Maker. Some of them <laughs> I really like. Like it's, it's you don't, you don't, you don't realize how it's much more valuable to be able to make something good and finished, but simple, than it is trying to make something big and complex because it'll fail. So honestly, just pick something small and just do it and do it well. Like make your make your goal to be the best ever breakout clone you could make make the best tetris or snake ripoff you could ever do add all the cool features you want add all the cool particles learn how to make swishy animations that project is 10 times more valuable to you than making a partial mmo with janky features so. well that was a great rant i think that's a great place to end this <laughs> yeah i think so because like, i'll be here all day if you keep talking about this topic so. <laughs> let's let's stop him before <laughs> we're here all day uh thank you everyone for joining in uh just one last time reminder to uh hit that like button uh thanks again in and out for the super chat really appreciate the support um and again we're going to be doing this on a weekly basis so check in all right guys i'm gonna yeah. end the stream well you had something you want to say no, no, I was going to say, you can catch us up on the discords. We're there if you ever want to chat or have any questions, and we'll see you next time. All right, see you next time. Give me one second. <laughs>